It's 1989, springtime in Washington, D.C. The cherry blossoms are in full bloom. It's a Friday evening, and I decide that myself, my girlfriend at the time, and another couple would go to our favorite restaurant in Georgetown. So we get in a cab, we're on our way to Georgetown, and if you spend any time in D.C. being one of the smartest cities in the country based upon the number of people 25 years and over who have earned a bachelor's degree, there's always a fine time for a good conversation. So the gentleman looks in the mirror and to the side and figures we're college students. So he goes to the first gentleman, he said, young man, what's your, you're a college student. And he said, yes, we all are. He said, great. He said, young man, what's your major? He said, zoology. He said, it's great. We need to have more people in the sciences, particularly if you want to become a doctor. Good for you. He looked at his date and said, well, what's your major? And she said, it's economics. And he said, oh, that's a great thing. We need people who can handle money and understand the economy. To my girlfriend, what's your major? She said, communications. He says, oh, we desperately need more people who are involved in communications to be able to articulate both in written and oral form all the great things we need. He said, young man, what's your major? I said, philosophy. And it was dead silence. <laughs> and unlike everyone else where he either looked to the side or looked in the mirror, he waited until he came to a stop sign. And he ceremoniously turned around and looked me in the eye. And his exact words were this. He said, oh, I see that you want to talk that bull. <laughs> there were three things that I learned from that comment, and two were immediate. Number one, the next time someone asked me that question, I'm a lie. <laughs> Number two, being true to myself and a lover of philosophy, I say I'm not going to lie, but the next time the question is raised, I will link it to future earning potential. I will say I'm studying to become a lawyer or studying to become a scientist. And that way people can exhale and feel good about themselves and I can avoid the laughter and the awkwardness that comes along with the silence when you say philosophy or the liberal arts. Third, which I learned later after 20 years of work as an educator involved in public policy and as an advocate, that we as a nation are undermining the social, economic, and militaristic underpinnings of who we are as a people by paying too little attention to the role the liberal arts have played in developing the nation and at the expense of believing that for somehow there is a disjunct between being competitive in the 21st century driven by technology, driven by a knowledge-based economy, where innovative and, uh, innovation and creativity matters for the sake of believing that those who major in the liberal arts need not apply. And I think that's a good segue into my formal introduction of saying that I bring greetings from Virginia Governor Bob McDonald and members of the administration. I'd like to thank the Pioneer Institute for the invitation to speak about a topic that I believe is vitally important, that is the role of the liberal arts and the achievement gap. Because I've learned that in the United States, you need an opportunity to have organizations like Pioneer who give us an opportunity to exhale and to talk and to share ideas. Because in the day-to-day -day mix of doing public policy, we often forget that there are some bigger ideas we need to make sure we remain anchored in. And in fact, the Pioneer Institute has played a role in that. I actually have in my possession a uh, brochure sent to me in 1996 by someone named Linda Brown when I was first opening a charter school in New Jersey and she was kind enough to send that and now I have a chance to serve uh, do an advisory capacity to the Institute, so glad to be here. When I go back to that 1989 conversation and to think that in 2011 there's still a belief that uh, the liberal arts have no role to play, it reminds me of something that I've learned very clearly in the role of academics and public policy and education. And it's real clear. <laughs> America does not suffer. In fact, America does not have an achievement gap problem. America has a political crap problem. And until you deal with a political crap problem, you will never solve the achievement gap problem. Because this is not a knowledge problem. Professor Ron Edmonds acknowledged in a 1983 article all that we need to know and have already assumed about what it means to educate and work with poor kids. Our public and private institutions of higher learning that are situated in Appalachia they know quite well what it takes to work with kids from rural areas, particularly first-generation students. For the elite public and private institutions, many in this commonwealth, who work with our best and brightest students, know what it takes to keep them engaged and motivated to complete a college degree in four, maybe five or six years. Because they understand that 
when you look at some of our dropouts at the high school level or some who come to college and become stopouts, smart enough to finish, finish, financially can finish, but dropped out of both because they were bored or unstimulated. They know what it takes. So it's not a knowledge problem. It's a political will problem. And so if we are to have an honest conversation about the achievement gap problem, we first have to deal with the political crap problem. And underlining that are three gaps that we have to close. And they also start with a P. The first is a perception gap. The, section, the second is a performance gap. And the third is a philosophical gap. Let's deal with the perception gap. The two speakers had referenced international comparisons. And I'm all for having international comparison because we live in a global society where we need, where we need to know, not only for economic purposes, but for intellectual curiosity, where we are with other nations. Virginia is right now in the midst of moving forward one of the governor's four initiatives that this administration rests, and that is higher education or education reform. We have a higher education commission, a new pro program put in place to move Virginia forward. And in preparation for our commission, we had to look at a lot of data. And we had one gentleman who could come to Virginia and provided some great information. When you look internationally as a country and commonwealth, and the same would be true for uh, Massachusetts, we're not doing that badly. For example, if you look at the number of adults, 25 to 64, in America, between the cohorts of 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and 55 to 64. If you compare those cohorts for the number of adults who at least have an associate's degree or better, we're not doing too badly. When you compare ourselves to uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation in Development Countries, we're actually higher than most across the board. This would include Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Korea, France, Belgium, and others. So that's the good thing. Could we do better? Absolutely. But when you realize that nearly 40% of, um, of adults in America within the 35 to 44 range at least have a associate's degree or higher, that's not bad. But we shouldn't stop there and congratulate ourselves because the scary part is when you look lower. When you look at the number of Americans or number of adults in America, 25 to 34, who have at least associates, well, associates or higher, you see a very, very different perspective. In Canada, it's 55 percent. In Japan, it's 55 percent. In fact, 56 percent. Japan is 54 percent. New Zealand, 47. Ireland, 44. Norway, 43. France and Belgium, 41. For the United States, it's lower than all of those countries. And so what does it mean? It means that between the dependent population ages, being 25 to 64, the ones who are the wage earners, the ones who pay into a system of retirement that all of us will have to adhere into at one point or another, the group that will be in the wage earning group the longest is also the least educated. In fact, we find out that industrialized nations, the United States and Germany, are the only two industrialized countries in the study they looked at to identify that the upcoming generation is less educated than the previous generation. And that raises some very interesting questions. So internationally, we're doing well, but we have some challenges. Well, what about domestically? Georgetown University Center for Education and Workforce in 2010 study had identified a number of researchers who said that in 2002, researchers identified that by 2014, at least 50% of the jobs in the United States will require post-secondary education. When they looked at number and looked at some fresher uh, figures, they identified that by 2018, two-thirds of the jobs in the U.S. will require post-secondary education. And some areas we're doing well, some areas, in fact, we have challenges. And in fact, the title of that was, was Help Wanted. And so when we look internationally and domestic, at the end of the day for lawmakers, all of this will come to the state level. We know there are at least 27 states where education is not the number one line item. But when you look at education, K-12, and health care, that's driving most of the budget. Surely in Virginia, it's education. And so when the governor uh, took the mantle of being uh, the leader for the state, he said we need to make sure that we keep Virginia competitive. 
last three years, according to a number of sources, Virginia is the best state in the country to do business. Great work environment. We're only second to California for the number of technology workers in place, and we have a great public system of education. The only state in the country uh, recently to have five public universities, um, four universities amongst the top 25 who graduate students in at least four years, UVA and the College of William Mary being second and third. And so we're in great, in great place, but we need to move a little further. So the governor has a very great plan in place to produce 100,000 new graduates over the next 15 years in, with the associate's degree or bachelor's degree particularly in the areas of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That in no way means there's no focus on uh, the, the liberal arts, but there is a focus on what we call top jobs. In fact, our legislation is called top jobs for the 21st century. And there's a focus and a correlation between certain majors and the demand for those. And so we took a look at some of the research in Virginia, the Virginia Business uh, Higher Education Council had a grow by degree campaign. And it was several principles in there where they said, if you follow the seven principles, we'll be able to grow degrees in Virginia and remain competitive. Two of those was to graduate 100,000 new degree holders, particularly in the STEM field. And second was to make sure there was a focus on science and technology. There's a Virginia's, uh, the Council for Virginia's Future. It's very clear that in order for us to look for a future in Virginia, there has to be a link to education. They also provided uh, information for us to consider. And even um, Professor Chumera, or I should say Dr. Chumera, in her report that was submitted to us, uh, looking at the role of career colleges. The first speaker, actually the second speaker had mentioned the role of technical colleges. Well, I can tell you right now that 78 of the 159 post-secondary institutions in Virginia are career colleges. It's the fastest growing sector of those who are seeking post-secondary options, most of them focusing on health care, science, or business, and computer science. So there's a push there. So when we have a conversation about the need to have more graduates, we will all applaud and say that's correct. But we also have to take a look at what do we mean by what degrees matter, because at the end of the day, there's a perception gap between majors and the marketplace. There's a belief that if you don't have a certain major, then you somehow cannot participate in the 21st century, or that your level of income somehow won't be sufficient for you to survive. Well, we know that there, there's a fact that there is a correlation between what you major in, particularly in STEM, and the amount of money you make. But it's, while it's a fact, it's actually not solely true that you cannot major in non-STEM majors and also be innovative and productive and produce jobs and create industry. We know in Virginia a number of people who major in the liberal arts who are business owners, employing hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. And so if we are to deal with the larger issue of the achievement cap, <coughs> gap going through the political crap aspect of it, one thing we have to do is we have to close perception gap. And that can be closed by admitting that there is a role for the liberal arts in any conversation about improving the economy at the state, domestic, international level, and that we as those who support the liberal arts need to remain at the table of influence and decision making to make sure it's there. Because when we talk of the uh, 21st century skills and there's a debate pro and con on either side, one thing we know is that creative thinking, that vision, that thinking broadly, the ability to connect ideas across space and time matter. And there are few aspects where you can put your flag and find that happening other than the liberal arts. And so for that aspect, we can close the perception gap problem. Let's look at the second one, which I call the performance uh, gap problem. We often look at it as an output perspective, uh, OESD, a CD, identified in his uh, PISA tests that when they looked at 5,500 stu 5, students who participated in that test, uh, particularly the students from Shanghai, you compared it to approximately 5,100 students in the U.S. who took the same exam. There were night and day differences for the American students and those uh, from China. America finished 23rd or 24th, depending on who you talk to, in science, in math, uh, Shanghai received 600, a score, U.S. 487. In reading, Shanghai, 556, the uh, U.S. 500, and in science, 575, 502 for the U.S. We finished, in fact, in math, in science, we finished 23rd. So at an international level, there is some concern that our students are not able to compete internationally. We also know that in many countries who we're compared to, college-bound students are the ones who take the test. 
where in the U.S. it's all of our students, those college bound or not. So whether there's some internal biases or not are always open for debate, but it still raises for, I guess, uh, consideration. There are some international challenges that we have to close a gap on. And so that's the international piece. You look domestically, some great room to brag. We know that uh, this commonwealth is far ahead of most. In fact, it's the most educated uh, uh, state or commonwealth in the country for the number of people 25 and over with a bachelor's degree. Uh, Virginia is uh, number six uh, for the air for what we have in terms of bachelor or higher degree holders. Uh, we're also uh, the state over the last three years have had the largest increase uh, in AP scores than any other state in the country. We've done pretty well, equally as well as this Commonwealth in NAEP scores. So we have a lot to celebrate and we should be glad of that because it shows there's starting to be more of a link between accountability. But let's also remember when we look at the state accountability aspect and the comparison, let's also make sure that we're looking at the information that we really need. Because if we rely on a performance index only to look at student output, I would say that's a very narrow view of the performance uh, gap because that's looking at output. I'd argue to really have an impact on the discussion about achieving in the long run, we have to look at the performance gap as it relates to input, and that would be with teachers. We know in a study from McKinsey where it looked at teachers from different countries, Finland and Singapore, for example, that 100% of the teachers in high-performing schools in these country finished in the top one-third of the graduating class. Top one-third. In the United States, 77% of our teachers did not graduate in the top one-third. Now, that in no way means that only high-quality teachers who are performing well in both commonwealths finish in the top third. There are plenty who did not finish in the top third, who are high-quality, who are producing some great students, who become great leaders. But it simply raises for a broader discussion how we train teachers and who we attract to the teaching profession. Now, I know this is a sensitive issue, and often when you bring up the issue of teachers, it's considered teacher bashing. This is an issue of teacher bashing. It's raising the question of who decides to become a teacher and what role do adults play in the process? Over the last 10 years, I've had an opportunity to participate in a couple of experiments. One relates to a paper that's unpublished that I write as my side writing called How Schools Educate Students Out of Their Calling. Because if you're a bright student and you show proclivity towards science, very seldom do we say you need to become a science teacher. We'll tell you to become a doctor, become a veterinarian. All those are great things. If you are very good in English, very good at grammar, we won't often encourage you to become an English teacher at high school. What we'll say is work for as an editor for a book publishing company. If you're great in music, we won't often say become a music teacher. We'll say you should go to Broadway or to, to Hollywood and make a career and do some great things. If you're good in mathematics, very few of us will send you off to become a math teacher. Instead, we say you should become an accountant. And we find other ways in a course. If you love to debate, become a lawyer. Very seldom do we say that you should actually become a speech coach or teach students about the importance of rhetoric, which at one point in the ancient days was a very important part of the classical liberal tradition or education in the traditional sense. And so we as adults do a great job of educating our best and brightest not to think about education. So from, report, from the performance gap aspect, to close it, we've got to encourage our students to also look at education. But also look at the role that educators themselves play in this aspect. Um, I'll do this experiment with you just because I want you visually to see. Now, I don't know who in here is an educator or not, but it will require you to stand. And so since you've been sitting for a while, I'll give you a chance to stretch your legs. If either your paternal or maternal grandmother or grandfather was an educator, and by that I mean principal, teacher, aide in the classroom, if they were an educator, please stand. So for those of you who can't see, there are several people who are standing. If you are, if your parent was an educator, please stand or remain standing. So most of those who stood the first time are still standing. More have stood. If you're an educator, please stand. More people who had a parent who was an educator, and he or she's an educator, still here. Remain standing if one of your children or your child is an educator. Very 
Interesting. One, two, three, four, five, six remain standing. Thank you for participating in this. When I do the same exercise for those in the health profession, 80% of those stand when it comes time to their children. When I do it for law, it's about the same. When I do it for educators, time and time again, we don't have many people standing. And that's for a host of reasons. One teacher was honest. He said, you know what, you're right. I told my child never to go in education. The number one reason people leave isn't because of money. It's because of not being supported or developed in that position. No training. So just keep in mind that when we want to train the next generation of educators, those who are educators, let's do a job of pushing them forward. So if we want to tr close the performance gap problem, we're going to have to do so by attracting, retaining, and rewarding the best and brightest to go into teaching. Well, let's look at the third P. That's a philosophical gap. We know from ancient times there was a lot of reasons of why philosophy came into being. And throughout space and time, there's always one question that will abound. What is the role of education? In the ancient time, it was driven by the idea of enlightenment, to bring one from physical, mental, or spiritual slavery into enlightenment for the purpose of liberty. There was also debates along the way of whether it was John Stuart Mill's on liberty of the role of the state in education or with Rousseau and dealing with the child and what role should the child's own interest play in education. The idea of what we should do with the, the, the Uber Mitch, what we should do with uh, moving later on to John Dewey and the role of education and community. Uh, and moving forward to the 20th century, even Dr. Milton Friedman pushing the idea that there was a universal need for universal education. Uh, there was also Dr. Howard Fuller who had a philosophy of parental options for social justice. So the idea that education matters from a philosophical standpoint is alive and well. What is the purpose of education? And from the philosophical standpoint, it has been for enlightenment. You have Virginia and, and, and Massachusetts, two commonwealths, two very important uh, entities in the creation of America. From a founding father's perspective, we know that John Adams played a role uh, in shaping what this commonwealth would think about education. So did his colleague from Virginia, President Thomas Jefferson, who wanted to use education as a way of supporting his little republics. And whether it was Noah Webster or Benjamin Rush or others, the whole idea was to inculcate values into young people from one generation to the next to make sure that this experiment that we call democracy with a Republican form of government would survive. And so there was always a push from the founding this matter. A lot of it steeped in philosophy and the liberal arts. Even our U.S. presidents over the years have gotten involved in becoming the education president even before it was popular to do so or popularized in 1998 when Al Gore was seeking office. We know that when native son John F. Kennedy when he was president talked about the importance of uh, education in the South being a moral issue or a moral crisis when we tried to block the doors for black kids to get an opportunity to go to school. We know that LBJ, President Johnson, the only U.S. president to earn a degree from a college of education, pushed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act as a philosophy of what role the federal government should play. We later find with President Nixon him trying to fashion a role of uh, local control or neighborhood schools as that had a role in the philosophical development and moving forward through Reagan, President Reagan who in 1983 at a speech at Seton Hall was able I guess rhetorically to jump over Thomas Jefferson's so-called wall of separation by advocating for private school vouchers and then moving forward to today where President uh, Barack Obama in his uh, inaugural, uh, inaugural speech made one of the few presidents to mention education or schools in his speech. And so there's a big push at the executive level for philosophy of education. Well, guess what? If you want to close the gap between philosophy and rhetoric of education, of really making it matter, we're going to have to close the philosophy gap. And we can do that by making sure that liberal arts has a role to play in defining the purpose of education, the role of education, and what it means for the economy. So you had three, perception gap, a performance gap, and a uh, philosophical or philosophy gap. How do we tie those into the area here? And I'll share a few things before I close. If we can close those gaps, then we can have an honest conversation about the achievement gap. Because the perceptions have driven policy for so long that sometimes it's kind of tough to figure out what's real and what's not. 
We can't wait for the newest crisis to create or invent a new reason for creating or inventing a new program to create or invent another reason why to move forward. David Tyak and Larry Cuban and their work tinkling towards utopia and other works talked about us doing this over and over again and reform again and again and again. But we can make this happen by acknowledging what happens at the State House. Having a chance to see this work at a state level, uh, it confirms that this is a political problem. It also confirms that we have to do a better job of getting rid of what I see the most troublesome part of school reform, and that's the overuse of the conjunction or. Either you have a career academy or you have a liberal arts academy. Either you prepare people for the 21st century by having STEM focus only or you have people who will sit around thinking deeply with no jobs and no businesses. Or we have conversations that in order for us to survive, those who major in the hard sciences will do better than the others. Wrong conjunction. The best conjunction for school reform and to deal with this is and. That you can't have liberal arts and the hard sciences. In fact, there was a point where the liberal arts were part of the hard sciences, where you could become a doctor by going through natural philosophy at some point many years ago. We can close the achievement gap by dealing with the political crap problem. And you have to deal with it by dealing with the other gap problems. This is the right institute to have a conversation because you're the ones on the front lines of policy and in classrooms and in organizations to see this happen. By doing that, the liberal arts will continue to blossom. By doing that, we'll continue to have more honest dialogue about how to keep America competitive because I believe simply marginalizing the liberal arts will come to our detriment and that in 2011, another student on a Friday evening in April in Washington, D.C. won't have the same conversation. So with that, I will open up for questions.